Thank you, everyone, and welcome to the Academy's 2019 Nickel Fellowships in Screenwriting's Awards. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Somebody's excited. Uh, Nickel Fellowships have been awarded by the Academy since 1986 to identify and to encourage talented new screenwriters and to nurture and include diverse artists and storytellers who are critical to keeping our industry vital and relevant. In addition to handing out awards, since 2013, this event has included a live reading of scenes from each of the award-winning screenplays performed by a cast of remarkable actors. This is one of my favorite nights at the Academy. I, I've been an eager audience member for all seven live reads, inviting a whole group of my friends to, to join me each year. My posse's out there somewhere tonight. But everyone here is, is in for a real treat. This event is the culmination of a year-long process. This year, it began with, get ready, 7,302 scripts submitted by writers in 70 countries, all 50 states, and even a member of the military stationed outside the country. All 7,302 scripts were read multiple times by teams of professional readers, and this year, that included three graduates from the Academy's new Diverse Reader Training Workshop, which offers free training in screenplay analysis to readers in underrepresented communities who will hopefully increase our chances of connecting with unique new storytellers. Readers select 1,000 scripts in the first round, 365 in the quarterfinals, and 149 in the semifinals. Academy member volunteers read the last 149 multiple times to select 12 finalists. Until that point, readers have no information about the writers. All the scripts are read blind. It's kind of like the voice, but without those chairs that swivel around. <laughs> the committee then reads each of the 12 finalist scripts multiple times to decide on the Nickel Fellows for the year. And the five new Nickel Fellows are, please hold your applause until the end, Aaron Chung for Princess Vietnam, Sean Malcolm for Mother, Karen McDermott for Lullabies of La Haula, Walter McKnight for Street Rat Alley Punches Her Ticket, and Renee Pillay for Boy with a Kite. Congratulations to you all. Uh, before, I, uh, before I join you in the audience, uh, I would just like to thank Joan Y, Senior Manager of the Nickel Fellowships Program, and her team, Chris Karchi and Melissa Park, for beautifully shepherding each stage of the Nickel Program. Thanks also to Randy Haberkamp, Managing Director of Preservation and Foundation Programs, for his dedication to the Nickel Project and to all the Academy Gold, Talent Development, and Inclusion Initiatives. Thank you, Randy. I'd also like to give a special shout out to our CEO, the Academy's Dawn Hudson, who's in the audience tonight. We thank her for enthusiastic support and her focus on diversity and inclusion in, in all aspects of the Academy. And I want to thank the more than 200 Academy members who volunteered to read 149 scripts in the semifinal round. And of course, special thanks to the Nickel Committee, 23 devoted Academy members and governors who volunteer their time and work tirelessly to assure that this fellowship upholds its standards and discovers the best and the brightest each and every year. And now it gives me great pleasure to introduce the chair of the Nickel Committee. Please welcome acclaimed director and Academy governor, Jennifer U. Nelson. Thank you, David, and thank you to Joan Y and the Academy staff for making this night possible. They work incredibly hard, so if you see them, give them a pat on the back. Um, welcome to the Nickel Fellowship and Screenwriting Awards and Live Read. It's going to be a great night where we get to celebrate the bright new futures and careers of a select and talented group of writers. Let's take a peek at the moment this year's writers got the news. Hi. 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 
this is members of the Nickel Committee. Hi, good afternoon. And we would like to tell you that you are a 2019 Nickel Fellow. Oh my god. Yes! <laughs> <laughs> That's wild. Oh wow. We loved your script. Next year is going to be really exciting. Thank you so much. I am absolutely honored and I'm blown away. Oh, he's like really happy. <laughs> I was shocked even to be a finalist, so this is just crazy. Congratulations. Hi. See you in Hollywood. Yeah. Congrats. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Academy Nickel Fellowship. Thank you. So wait, so I'm a fellow, right? You you are a nickel fellow. Yes. Thousands of scripts submitted, only 12 become finalists. And even though five will become Nickel Fellows this year, being a finalist is in itself an amazing achievement. So I'd like to um, ask the finalists here tonight to please stand for a round of applause. So where are they? Where are they? Yeah, there you are. Tonight marks the beginning of a year of fellowship, one where the winners, the writers whose work you see on stage tonight will receive support, mentorship, and most importantly, access. Access so their words and ideas can reach audiences and screens everywhere. This year alone, past Nickel Fellows have worked on the following projects. Escape Room, Relive, Extremely Wicked, Shockingly Evil, and Vile, The Kid, Dumbo, Brian Banks, Just Mercy, Unbelievable, Mary, For All Mankind, and that's just this year. A Nickel Fellowship can kick open a door and offer that chance for a talented writer to show what they can do. In fact, our director for The Read Tonight, Gita Malik, is a past Nickel Fellow. I remember her winning script, Dinner with Friends, a fun and insightful story about an American in, um, Indian American family and everyone thought it was just ready to go out and make. So that's what she did. <laughs> this spring, she wrote and directed her feature film, now called India, Sweets and Spices, and is finishing up in post. She is also writing a pilot for TriStar based on a young adult novel, and she was the first recipient of the Academy Gold Fellowship for Women in 2018 has become an inspiration for others to follow. She'll be directing an amazing cast of actors. Thank you to Tyrese Gibson, Rosa Salazar, Amanda Stenberg, and Wes Judy for showing their support to the Nickel Fellows. Tonight, let's celebrate our winners and their work. And now Gita Malik will begin our read. Thank you. Thanks, Jen, and thank you to the whole Nickel team and to the Academy staff for making this special evening possible. As Jen said, it wasn't so long ago that I was in one of those very seats as a Nickel winner myself, sitting there in awe as these magical actors actually spoke the words that I'd written. It was an incredible experience, and I'm very honored to be here tonight behind the podium. One more friendly reminder to please make sure your cell phones are off. There is no photography or video recording tonight. There's just one exception. Uh, the Academy's social media person is here in front somewhere covering our event. Rest assured, there she is, Angel. Uh, rest assured, she will capture everything and post to Instagram for all of us. And uh, she's the only one allowed to be using her phone, so please don't join her. Tonight would not be possible without these four amazing and talented people joining us. It is my pleasure to introduce the actors who will be performing scenes from the Nickel winning scripts. Amanda Stenberg is an actress and singer-songwriter. She portrayed Rue in The Hunger Games, Madeline Whittier in Everything Everything, and Star Carter in The Hate You Give. She will next be seen in Oscar winner Damien Chazelle's musical drama series, The Eddie, for Netflix, Amanda Stenberg. Tyrese Gibson is a filmmaker, six-time Grammy-nominated musician and philanthropist. 
Gibson just wrapped production on the upcoming film Morbius, part of Sony's Marvel Universe, alongside Oscar winner Jared Leto. He can be seen next starring in Dion Taylor's thriller, Black and Blue, alongside Oscar nominee Naomi Harris. Tyrese Gibson. <laughs> Rosa Salazar is a film and television actress currently starring in Undone for Amazon Prime. Previously, she played the title character in the film Alita, Battle Angel. She's appeared in the Maze Runner, and, uh, in Maze Runner series and also appeared in the Netflix films The Kindergarten Teacher and Bird Box. Rosa Salazar. Wes Studi is an actor and film producer. Studi received an honorary Oscar 11 days ago at the Governor's Awards. <laughs> He's appeared in many, many films, including Hostels, Avatar, and The Last of the Mohicans. Wes Studi. Let's dive in. Our first script is Princess Vietnam by Aaron Chung. In 19... <laughs> we can clap, yes, well done. <laughs> Princess Vietnam. In 1980, a lonely Vietnamese girl befriends and falls in love with an imaginative Irish girl as they confront racial prejudice in their small town. After a fiery incident, Fable and Ashling our two young lovers are forced to split apart, Fable struggling with her disapproving mother and Ashling going into hiding. Ever since Fable professed her love, Ashling is feeling doubt in their relationship, wanting some distance. Fable awaits a phone call from Ashling, a connection after days of silence. Interior, Sue's house, kitchen, continuous, Fable prepares dinner for herself, putting rice in a bowl and pouring lukewarm soup in another. Interior room continuous. Fable eats alone. The phone rings. Fable drops everything to answer it. Hello? Intercut with interior dilapidated apartment complex, lobby, night. Ashling is at one of the pay phones. She takes to the corner where an Abandoned doll, a raggedy cat with both eyes missing, lays crumpled. Hey, princess. Hi. Fable can barely contain her joy. How's the other side? It's going. And your mom? Fable holds her breath. She listens intently for any signs of her mother. Just in case, she pulls the phone closer to her lips and speaks in a hushed voice. She's fine. That's good. Both girls are at a loss for words, searching for the next thing to say. How's my cousin treating you? Oh, he's been cool with me so far. Wilma, too. I never really spoke to her before. <laughs> she kind of reminds me of my mom. Yeah? She asked about you. What'd you tell her? Just that you need some space. I didn't mention the, you know... Good girl. Another tense silence. I saw your dad. Aisling, Ashling's face drops. Oh, shit. He came to the theater. He misses you, Ashling. He tell you that? No, but he just looks, I don't know, sad. He just looks really sad. Did he mention all the Vietnamese he gunned down to? Ashling. You don't know my dad. Do you? Ashling stiffens. Her knuckles crack. How can you even say that? You didn't see him. Fable takes a moment. She's considering her own words, what she's saying about Bill. She stands firm. You didn't see him. I saw him plenty. A beat. Fable takes a breath. I'm sorry, Ashling. I'm just telling you what happened. Okay. 
Ashling softens, swallowing her anger. I'm sorry, too. Fable checks for her mother again. Hey. What? Can I ask you something? Shoot. Did you really ask me to leave because you needed space? Ashling knows the answer, but she doesn't want to say it. I do, Fable. Why do I have the feeling it's something else? Ashling takes a deep breath. There's no avoiding it. She knew this was coming. Fable, don't think it's you. You did nothing wrong. What are you saying? I'm, I'm getting to it. I, it. It's too fucking hard. It's something you said. What did I say? The night before we left, you said these words, and I don't know what I was supposed to say back. Fable tries to recall that night. It's flooding back to her. She shuts her eyes. Fuck. I said I love you. Beat. Yeah. Fable clenches the phone, hating herself, ready to bang her head against the wall. Ashling, I'm so sorry. I, I didn't... I was... No, no. It's like I said. It's me. You did nothing wrong. No, but I did. I did. God, I'm so stupid. I don't think I... I I don't know if I... Fable I, can't bring herself to lie. Can I just take it back? Ashling bites down on her lip. You can't. I mean, you shouldn't. Fable swallows her tears. Even on the phone, she's trying to regain her composure. Firm, strong, no matter what. Ashling, on the other hand, rattles the payphone. Yeah, okay. Then I guess that's that, right? Fable, I want to be with you. I do. But I don't know if I can feel that same thing yet. Fable's eyes water. Yeah, I get it. I do. I do. That word, it's poison to me. It's okay, Ashling, really. But it's not your fault. I know. I heard you. Ashling forces a laugh through her tears. <sighs> I must sound like a broken fucking record, right? Fable musters up a smile, but it falls quick. You're... Fable cuts short because she knows they've reached the end. Stay safe, Ashling. Ashling wants to say something else. It's right on the tip of her tongue, but she knows better. Yeah, you too, princess. Fable hangs up first. End. Intercut. She stands by the phone. Her dinner's getting cold behind her. The whole house is a hollow shell. She grips her mouth tight. She can't let her tears escape. She refuses. Just around the corner, On leans against the wall. Her head pointed towards the dining room table. Whether or not she's been there the whole time, it's clear that her little girl is in great pain. Let me introduce our two presenters for this award, both members of the Nickel Committee. Marcus Hu is co-president of Strand Releasing, which is celebrating their 30th anniversary this year with retrospectives across the country. He resides in both Los Angeles and San Francisco, and he served six years on the Nickel Fellowships Committee. And Kirsten Kiwi-Smith is a screenwriter and producer. She co-wrote the hit comedies Legally Blonde, 10 Things I Hate About You, She's the Man, and The House Bunny, among others. This is her sixth year on the Nickel Committee. Presenting the award to Aaron Chung are Marcus Hu and Kiwi-Smith. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Oh, that was beautiful. That was so beautiful. We love this script. I know. We, when we read this script, we sat together and... and like we, teenage girls. Yeah. And we were like comparing <laughs> notes and we said, oh my God, we just absolutely love this one. Yeah, we flipped out. We flipped yeah. out. Like we fell head first into this world and heart first. And um, these characters are so beautiful. And 
Um, you know, the relationship is complex and the writing is so poetic, Erin, it's just gorgeous. Um, you know, Erin just brilliantly captures uh, the naturalness and authenticity of, of teenage female voices. And um, what's crazy is he graduated from film school two years ago and, and he has written five screenplays. This is his fifth screenplay. He's written across so many genres. He's written action, horror, sci-fi. He's written a high school comedy, which I personally cannot wait to read. Um, and uh, he's culminated, his work culminated in this screenplay. And we got to meet him for um, yesterday, which feels yeah. like a lifetime ago. At the luncheon. At the luncheon. And, um, he reminded me that we'd actually met before because he was an intern a year ago for my manager. So we've already, we were, we're longtime friends. Um, <laughs> but uh, cut to now a year later, and he entered his very first screenwriting competition, The Nickel, and he won, um, which is so impressive. And it's so, it's so great. And, and uh, yesterday we got to hand him his... Uh, we got to hold, hand him an Oscar, Oscar to hold, and we just feel for like the first time, and we just have a feeling this is not going to be his last time. That wasn't his last time. That was only his first time holding an Oscar. And we, Aaron, just congratulations. We we thank you for bringing all your your poetry and artistry to to this stage and and to the community. We just can't wait to get to work with you and and get to know you. And congratulations. And make thank you for making such a great script about two girls who fall in love in yes. such a beautiful way. Yes. Please, Aaron. Come on up, Aaron. There's so many of you. Um, well, first of all, thank you, Kiwi and Marcus, for that very, very flattering introduction. Uh, thank you to uh, Wes, Rosa, Mandela, and Gita for rescuing my words. Wow. Um, thank you to the Academy, Jennifer, Joan, the entire committee, for this opportunity and for seeing something in me that I haven't seen yet. Um, and thank you to my Florida State family, my close friends, my colleagues, my mentors and teachers who have helped me and guided me to develop my voice and to make this script. And most of all, thank you to my family, my tireless mother, my resilient father, my supportive sister, and my amazing brother-in-law. Thank you so, so much for just everything. So before today, as I was preparing this speech, I was writing about who I am and why I chose to become a writer and why I chose to write this script. And it recently, it just felt off to me because that's not the reason why I want to write. I mean, I want to share my voice, but it's not just my voice, it's everyone's voice. And I want to connect everyone's problems and struggles and conflicts and show that we have a lot more in common than we believe. And I wrote Fable on Ashling, two characters, these two kids who had every right to not be together because they were so different. And I, and they just happened to find each other and fall in love. And through that, they've brought a little bit of hope in their crumbling world. And I know that sounds a little cheesy and it belongs in a Hallmark card, but I believe it rings a little true because not just storytellers, but like all of us people, we have this amazing superpower to empathize and connect and understand each other in ways that no other living creatures can. But we often don't use that power and instead we weaponize our experiences and our opinions and our intellect and our accomplishments to make others feel inferior and silence them, which is just, a shame because we all, we are all sharing this common goal, this one dream, which is to try and be better versions of ourselves than we were yesterday. 
So I stand before you today to make a promise that tomorrow or the day after that and the day after that, I will try and try to be a better person than you see here today. I will try to empathize. I will try to listen. I will try to speak up for others and give a voice to the voiceless and extend a helping hand to those who are in dire need of it. And I promise that I will try to be just a better role model. And I feel like a lot of us, we all should have that goal. And although we will all stumble and fall and make mistakes, trust me, I have made millions of them. And I regret and feel so ashamed for so many of them. But no matter what, it's, it's what we should do because it could bring a little bit of hope and love into our own crumbling world. So thank you so much. You are all wonderful, lovely, beautiful people. Thank you. <laughs> You're wonderful and lovely and beautiful too, Aaron. Our next script is titled Mother, written by Sean Malcolm. It's about a Syrian mother trapped in Aleppo who becomes a sniper to defend her family. <clears throat> in this scene, Farida and her son Sammy are trapped in their rebel-held neighborhood in Aleppo, surrounded by regime forces on all sides. Her husband and father have disappeared after venturing out to find medicine, and the situation has never been more dire. When a charming rebel commander offers her food in exchange for a home-cooked meal, she has no choice but to oblige. Interior, Frida's apartment, dining area, later that night. The power is still out. The dining table is lit by two candles and a flashlight. Farida sits with Sammy next to her, the soldier across from them. They're enjoying minced lamb with bread and chickpeas. All three eat with gusto. Sammy is shy, not looking up much, but enjoying the food. My husband says not to eat near the window when the power is out. We've established a solid perimeter around the area. It's safe. He chews heartily, then washes it down with water. Between the snipers like myself and our anti-tank missiles, every time they try and enter, we stop them. She listens, eating modestly, rarely looking up. Sammy looks up for a moment, stares at him. Are they going to blow up our house? Soldier studies him for a long moment. No. The regime can't afford to waste munitions on empty buildings. So they wait on the outskirts, avoiding losses. They believe if they can circle us and wait, we'll give up. But we'll never surrender. Aleppo, right? Sammy nods as if he understands, looks back to his plate. Soldier takes another bite, savoring it. We have reinforcements coming, armed with more gifts from the Americans. If we can hold out, there's talk of a negotiation in Geneva, maybe even a ceasefire. Those words send a glimmer of hope across the table. She looks at Sammy, notices him rubbing his eye. Excuse me, my son is very tired. She rises picks up one of the flashlights. I'm not tired, Mama. She takes him by the arm. I know, I know. Say goodnight to Mr. Hamid and thank you for dinner. Thank you for dinner, Mr. Hamid. Soldier smiles at him. Good night, little soldier. She guides Sammy away by the beam of the light. Interior Sammy's room continuous. She tucks him under his blanket and hands him the flashlight. Don't waste the battery, okay? Okay. Will you feed the kitty? Yeah, I'll feed kitty. Okay. I miss Baba. Me too, my love. Every time I pray, I ask Allah to bring him home. Me too. Good. Allah is watching over us. Remember that. Good night. Good night, Mama. She turns off his flashlight, leaves his door slightly ajar. Interior, Frida's apartment, dining area, continuous. Frida sits back at the table across from Soldier. 
I can tell you're a caring mother. Thank you. Loving your child isn't hard, it's natural. Yes, instinct. She sips her water, then looks over at the sniper rifle leaning against the wall. I could never do what you do. He thinks for a moment. No one is born a killer. We only fight because we have to. He stares at her. Maybe we're not so different. You know, you and I. She looks at him, not sure she agrees, but unwilling to challenge him. I don't know whether it's instinct or destiny, but I know it's his will. It seems to me our instincts often go against his will, but how could I know for sure? He shrugs. Here's what I can tell you. <clears throat> when it's your life or theirs, the act is simple. You raise the barrel, resting it on your arm. Listening? Or the windowsill. It's like this. Focus the scope, finding your target in the crosshairs. And you hold the butt tight against your cheek to move with the recoil. You exhale deeply so your breathing doesn't move the barrel. And when all your breath has left your body, and not one ounce remains. Pow! Pull the trigger. Physics does the rest. She looks at him. His eyes only seem colder in the dim light. He puts his arms down. Something changes in you. You know, it can never be undone when you accept this. It, it becomes easier. She looks at him suddenly aware of how uncomfortable she's become with a stranger in her house at this hour. Well, I hope you enjoyed the meal. We appreciate your kindness. He leans back, studying her. It's not a problem. I can protect you and your son. She looks at him a bit sideways. We're fine, thank you. My husband and my father. No, I didn't want you to say, I'm sorry. I didn't want you to say it in front of your son but you realize you will never see them again, right? She stares at him hard, gaze narrowing. He's a survivor and he'll be home any time. I know it, he's very resourceful. He bores back into her with his eyes. You're lying to yourself. We're surrounded. The regime would never let him pass through. He's been disappeared. He's been disappeared. If he's not already dead. She stands. I want you to leave now, please. He looks at her, a dark glint in his eyes. He reaches into his pocket, pulls out a nine millimeter pistol and casually rests it on the table, keeping it tight in his hand. Don't make this difficult. You knew I wanted more than a meal. And you let me in. No one has to know. He stands, the gun in his hand, moves closer. She's shaking. A pious woman like you could, could be stoned to death. A pious woman like you could be stoned to death. Do the right thing for your son. Keep your mouth shut. He rushes forward, smothering her with one hand as he puts the gun to her head with the other. Stephen Ulaki is a documentary filmmaker. <laughs> Stephen Ulaki is a documentary filmmaker, a former HBO studio executive, a feature producer, and most recently dean of the School of Film and Television at Loyola Marymount University for eight years. Last year, he stepped down from LMU, and weeks later was accepted into the academy and joined the Nickel Fellowships Committee. He is currently working on a documentary on progressive evangelicals. 
Presenting the award to Sean Malcolm is Stephen Ulaki. I'd like to say that um, when I first started out, um, when I fell in love with film, I made documentaries. And then when I um, started doing features, fiction work, I still always found that films that had a documentary basis, or that could have been, could have been documentaries, uh, were the ones that most, uh, most in interested me. I look, for example, The Battle of Algiers. Uh, a film that can take the reality of documentary. Yes, good applaud. Uh, the reality the documentary does, and yet at the same time, uh, what you can't get in a documentary, a fictional film can supply. When I read Mother, um, I was absolutely overwhelmed by the fact that I thought I was seeing something that could become as good a film as The Battle of Algiers. Uh, it is an absolutely timeless work. You've got a sense of some of the drama in that terrific scene that you just, you just saw. Um, and I just wanted to, uh, I'm very, very proud uh, to be able to present uh, the writer of that script, uh, Sean Malcolm, uh, the Nickel Fellowship Award, because um, I hope and really pray and think that there's a good chance that that film uh, that script could be made into a film because it actually uh, is, the timing is perfect, absolutely perfect. And for whoever is interested in the film, and I know some people are interested in it already, I would just urge that, that and hope that that happened. And on that note, I'd like to ha ask uh, Sean Malcolm to step up. Mm -hmm. Wow, um, Stephen, I had no idea that you were going to equate me with something like that, and your words are so kind. Thank you so much. It's very hard to see all of you out there, but I know you're there. I have a few words. I'll try to do it quickly because I know we're on a time limit, but the truth is um, I do have a few things to say. So thank you for that introduction. Thank you, these actors. That was absolutely incredible. You guys are amazing for sharing your talent and time tonight and breathing words, breathing my words, our words, into life for the very first time. When you write something, you don't have the benefit of anything other than hear it in your head, and you guys are absolutely stunning. Thank you, Gita, for directing these scenes. It's incredible. Obviously, I have to thank um, the entire Nickel team, Joan and Randy and Chris and Melissa, wherever you guys are out there. You're absolutely amazing. Um, this week has been phenomenal. Um, and of course, all the readers and the Academy judges um, who give their time every year and their energy to this incredible fellowship, we could not do this without you, and you guys are so generous. Um, also, I just want to say a shout out to the Nickel alumni who spent their time with us this week. They shared their wisdom with us, and that was incredibly, incredibly helpful. Um, of course, lastly but not least, in terms of my initial thanks, we have to thank Don and Guy Nickel for the creation of this fellowship. This fellowship has been such an inspiration to me and so many writers around the world for so many years. It's an incredible gift and obviously an incredible legacy. So thank you to them. Also, I just want to quickly say thank you to the Academy because I've always really, really wanted to say that <laughs> wherever the Academy is. Um, and thank you specifically to the committee, all the members of the committee, you guys, this, this honor that you've bestowed on me and the other four fellows this year is, it's really beyond comprehension. I'm, I'm absolutely humbled. And also the other finalists that were in our group, it's an incredible group of writers and I'm absolutely stunned by all the talent and just privileged to be part of this. Um, words are never really gonna fully capture what this means to me, 
but I am a writer, so I figured I would try. Imagine you've been slaving away at this maddening pursuit called screenwriting for 20 plus years, and you've really gotten comfortable with the idea of obscurity. <laughs> it's fine, really, total obscurity, it's very comfortable, I'm good with it. And then suddenly one day, you find yourself in the Academy's headquarters on the seventh floor of this very building. You've just had lunch with Eva Marie Saint in a room full of legends and icons. Your phone is buzzing because a producer is trying to get a hold of you, somebody who wants to make your script. You step out into the lounge to return the phone call you're looking at the panoramic view of the Hollywood Hills and you find yourself staring right at the Hollywood sign. It's literally, it's ridiculous, right? It's, it's, it's so on the nose, nobody would ever buy it. <laughs> the only thing that came into my mind was a talking head song, Once in a Lifetime. And you may say to yourself, well, how did I get here? Literally. And then it was, oh my God. What have I done? <sighs> That's the magic of the nickel. That's what this is. <sighs> so how did I get here very quickly? We all take a different path. Aaron's path, so straight and narrow. <laughs> <laughs> Mine so circuitous, if that's the way you pronounce it. Um, circuitous, thank you. So the truth is, my journey began 21 years ago in 1998. And in 1998, I actually submitted my very first screenplay. And ironically, as evidence, I have my very first letter right here. And actually, I was looking at this today. I mailed this script to 8949 Wilshire Boulevard, which is the building we are standing in. Or I'm standing in, you're sitting in. 21 years ago. And yes, for the kids out there, we did mail them in. There was not a thing called PDF. <laughs> so if you can imagine thousands of physical scripts coming to this building and how they did it is just unbelievable. Shortly after that letter was sent in, I got my first Dear Sean. Unfortunately, <laughs> your screenplay did not advance to the quarterfinals. And so began a very long and twisted romance. From 98 to 2019, year after year, I kept writing, submitting. I tried dramas. I wrote a black comedy. I wrote some science fiction. I did a ghost story. I did a techno thriller. <laughs> what do these guys want from me? <laughs> I even wrote a screenplay about a screenwriter who writes a screenplay <laughs> about a screenwriter. And one of them dies along the way. I forget which one it was. It wasn't being John Malkovich, trust me. Mostly it went like this, dear Sean, each year the competition gets harder. We regret to inform you that your script, blah, 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 blah. But here's the thing. Every single time I felt like giving up, a little piece of positive reinforcement, validation would come my way from the nickel. Congratulations, you made the quarter with this script. Congratulations, this one has advanced. <sighs> they would pull me back in. <laughs> and then came Mother. And this story, unlike so many others, um, it started with a single photograph. It was a picture of a young boy in Aleppo, uh, about the same age as my son, who's here tonight. He had just survived an airstrike just minutes before. And I knew I had to somehow tell a story. I didn't know who he was, and I probably never will. But for the first time in my life, I tried writing from my heart instead of my head. And that made a huge difference. It's a lesson as a writer that I will never forget. I know this is a celebration tonight, but it would not be right for me to stand here and not say a word about the Syrian people. It's simply this. We do not have to accept what is happening to our fellow human beings on this planet. We do not. Every one of us can make a difference together, especially when we act together. 
If you want to help but you're unsure how, a great place to start is to simply go to whitehelmets.org or rescue.org. They are doing work on the ground, and you, with a few bucks, can make a difference. Let me just wrap up quickly by thanking the people who've made a difference in my life. My mom, Patty, is here tonight. Mom, I love you. I have no doubt that my loyalty and love and respect for all the women in my life began with you. I want to thank all my friends and family that are here tonight and around the world. There's too many of you. It's a tree with many branches, but your love and support has meant everything to me, and I appreciate it so much. I especially want to thank my beautiful wife, Ivana. She's here tonight as well. Everyone knows I won the lottery when I met you. Um, among so many other things that I love about you, your instincts are flawless. And so even though we have different tastes in film, I know that if I write something I like and you actually like it too, I might have actually done something diff uh, very decent. Um, my two kids are here tonight, Juliana and Aiden. Guys, you're my pride and joy. I love you with all my heart, and being your dad is the best gift I will ever have. And lastly, I just have to thank my dad, Robert Furell. Um, he was many things in his life. He was also an English professor and an absolute connoisseur of the written word. And for a self-taught writer like myself, who never made it to college, having him as a dad turned out to be uh, a bit of incredible good fortune. Um, even though we were so far apart, thousands of miles apart for many years, he read all my scripts, he gave me his feedback, and he never once said a harsh word or said anything about my stories. He only ever encouraged me. Mother turned out to be the last script that he would ever read. He told me he loved it, and he was convinced that something good was bound to come of it. And tonight proves he was right, as he usually was. And so I just want to accept this fellowship in his spirit because I know it's his love of language that is embedded in my DNA. It is his love of story that runs in my blood. And it is his kindness as both a father and a teacher that is forever written in my heart. Thank you. Thank you. That was beautiful. That was beautiful. That was beautiful. I just need some water. Yeah. yeah. John. All right. Our next script is called Lullabies of La Haula by Karen McDermott. <clears throat> Separated from her family during a desperate border crossing and held in a cage for migrant children, 14-year-old Dalia Ramirez draws strength from the wisdom of the poetry of a Spanish revolutionary as she struggles to survive. In the aftermath of a brawl in the cage, Dalia spends a hellish night singing lullabies to the younger girls, trying to drown out the screams of boys being beaten by guards. And then finally, a moment of peace. In this scene, she meets a 16-year-old Salvadoran boy named Juan Alberto, who will become her first love. Exterior, recreation field, day. Watching the smaller boys play soccer, Dahlia hears the sound of dusty footfalls behind her and a voice. See it out there. The warning. Dahlia turns to see Juan Alberto, follows the direction of his gaze. Out past the fence, blue and orange with the face, Atlua, painting on it. Atlawa? The Aztec, god of water. Dahlia squints into the distance, looks for a colorfully painted rock. The Aztec prayed to prevent drownings. I see it. I'm Juan Alberto. He gives her a charming leap. <laughs> Don't laugh Shy at me. smile. <laughs> You're the one who brings Hector over at night? 
I am Dahlia. I know. <laughs> she smiles, looks back out at the distance. What's the warning rock warning about? Well, it's, it's flush to the ground, so you can't see it unless you're right up on it. The gringos don't know it's there. They don't know how to read the warning. How do you know about it? There's a hole in the fence. You tried to escape? No, 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 no. There's no place to escape to. I just wanted to see the rock close up. They stand in silence. Both looking at the bit of color of their culture in a sand and barbed wire filled horizon. Do you know Miguel Hernandez, the poet? Juan Alberto shakes his head. He has a poem about a well. It gives me hope. She recites in Spanish. Un albanil quería. Piedra tras piedra, muro tras muro. A mason wanted, stone after stone, one well after another. Juan Alberto listens, his dark eyes drawn into the story, or its teller, as she continues. Reída, trabajaba, cantaba. This time, Juan Alberto provides the translation. He laughed. He worked. He sang. <laughs> Dahlia smiles. Un albanil quería, pero aquel hombre labraba su carcel. Again, he translates. A mason wanted, but that man was fashioning his jail. Y en su obra fueron precipitados El y el viento. Mm. And both he and the wind were thrown into his work. He considers. He dies in the well he built. But you said it gives you hope. The American president is always building Stone after stone. She looks out at the still desert. But the wind is coming, I think. <laughs> For our next presenting duo, we have... Peter Samuelson, who's a producer and the founder of five charities for children who are seriously ill, homeless, or in foster care. His 26 films include Arlington Road, Wild, Tom and Viv, and Revenge of the Nerds. Peter has been a member of the Nickel Committee for two decades. And Eva Marie Saint is an Oscar winner for On the Waterfront and unforgettable in North by Northwest. Eva Marie Saint is also an Emmy winner, and for the kids among us, was the voice of Katara in the animated series, The Legend of Korra. <laughs> she has served on the Academy Nickel Fellowships Committee for 30 years. Presenting the award to Karen McDermott are Peter Samuelson and Eva Marie Saint. Such a nice, hi, where, oh, you, okay. <laughs> I thought it was a shadow. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's, I, I love the idea with the actors uh, enact a scene from a, from <laughs> one of these stories. It just, it brings it to life and you're all wonderful. I just have to say that, actor to actor. Karen McDermott, who wrote Lullabies of La Haula, she said, quote, 
I felt compelled to tell this story because I'm outraged that children are being caged in America. As a former attorney specializing in child abuse and neglect, I know what the trauma experienced by neglected children looks like. She wrote Lullabies of La Hala. It is a story of a 15-year-old, and her name is Dahlia. She, her mother, and brother made the dearness journey to the border. Her brother was killed. She is put in a cage and separated from her mother. She is a brave young girl and makes friends with the other children in the cage. She loves books and she reads them. She becomes their mother. But she misses her own mother. One day, a well-to-do white couple visits the cage and meets Dahlia. They sign the papers and drive her to her beautiful home by the sea. She goes to school and she tries very hard to accept the situation. However, she does miss her mother and she is determined to find her. Eventually she does and her mom working in a florist shop. Karen McDermott, who wrote Lullabies of La Hala, said, I felt compelled to tell this story because I'm outraged that children are being caged in America as a former attorney specializing in child abuse and neglect. I know that the trauma experienced by neglected neglect children looks like. And I would like to invite her to come up right now. Oh, no, you're coming up. The man's coming up. All right. It's no secret to anyone here that we are living in dark and dangerous times. What perhaps we should be focusing on is the role that audiovisual storytelling is playing in the gathering darkness. Those who, through demagoguery, seek to divide us, to emphasize the sense of other, to make us hate each other, they understand through training in reality television that schadenfreude is a potent base human instinct, meaning enjoying the suffering of others, reveling in difference, enjoying someone's misfortune and their downfall. Luckily, audiovisual storytelling can be used equally well and perhaps much better, we hope, for the forces of the angels to prevail. Because the bully pulpit that we are facing, every time you turn on news television, has an antidote. And I'd like to suggest that all of us here, the professionals here, whether your creativity, your art, your science is through acting or writing or directing or producing or the myriad other ways that we help to get films made, we should all be asking ourselves in this time of peril and gathering darkness, what we can personally do beyond the next seventh sequel to some franchise which is based in using visual special effects to defy the laws of physics, we should be asking ourselves, what can I do to make my world a little less grim? How can I generate empathy through the power of my pen, my voice, my camera, how can I lift people up 
and to emphasize the commonality of mankind which links us all. What Karen McDermott has done elegantly, powerfully, with emotion, with, with technique, with, with huge impact in lullabies of La Haula is to show us that this family that is thrown into chaos from the moment that they have to escape from evil that has killed the son in the family through the new evil that awaits them on the other side of the tunnel into the United States, which separates mother from daughter and encages the 15-year-old, what we understand is that family is family, that these people who speak a different language, who look a little bit different perhaps, they are us and we are them. And Karen, by telling this extraordinary story of personal bravery of a 15-year-old who actually realizes that there is something the matter with being fostered by a well-meaning but tone-deaf white couple in their very elegant and expensive home and being thrown a lavish quinceañera where the only Hispanic people present are herself and the mariachi band, <laughs> there is something wrong with that picture. And her being possessed to find her mother, which she finally manages to do, lifts us all up and shows us that even in the face of evil done by people in uniforms, carrying guns and locking children in cages using our tax dollars, even given that, even though, you know, Santayana said, those who forget the mistakes of history are doomed to repeat them. My thoughts go to 1932, 1933, 1934, somewhere else, and the power of media in that time, Lenny Riefenstahl and so forth. We need to, every person here, in the Samuel Goldwyn Theater needs to be asking themselves, as well as making a living, as well as getting my material made, as well as getting that next acting assignment, how can I actually use whatever God-given skills I have to lift up my world, to emphasize what we all have in common, and to build bridges rather than walls. I have the great honor with Eva Marie Saint to ask Karen McDonald to come up and receive her <laughs> Nickel Fellowship in screenwriting. Salazar, I didn't realize the power of that last line until I heard you recite it. Thank you so much. Tyrese Gibson, I never thought of Juan Alberto as sexy. But <laughs> Apparently he is. You just made more work for me, Tyrese. I have to go in and add some scenes where he's shirtless now. <laughs> Thank you so much, Peter Samuelson and Eva Marie Saint. This is a, such a dream come true. Thank you for putting so much thought and generosity into that introduction. I, I have to say this whole Eva Marie, Eva Marie Saint thing is throwing me. It would throw you too. 
Thank you to the Nickel Committee, Joan Y, and all of the Nickel judges. But more than anyone tonight, I need to thank my students, the people who inspired this script. First year composition students at California State University, Los Angeles. Cal State LA in the house. That surprises me because a couple of my students asked me if they would get extra credit for coming tonight. I said, no, but you'll get public recognition in the Academy Award Theater. And they were like, eh, but no extra credit? In the fall of 2018, I knew I wanted to write about the caging of migrant children in America. I was infuriated, and I wanted to put a face to the policy of family separation. I wanted us to see it through the eyes of a child. But I knew it was a difficult subject to think about, let alone write about. So I talked to my Mexican-American students about it, and they said, we'll help you, and they did. My students helped me with the Spanish. They fact-checked me. They did. They told me stories about their family's border crossings and about the conditions in their home countries. And all of this informed the script. Two of my students allowed me to use their names. Thank you, Juan Alberto, for the use of your beautiful name. I'm sorry I had to kill you. Thank you, Estefany, for the use of your beautiful name. I'm sorry I had to kill you, too. <laughs> hey, I had to kill some children. I was trying to make a point. And I was trying to make Eva Marie Saint cry. No, I wasn't. I wasn't trying. But if she was going to cry, the cry I had in mind was the one from the auction scene in North by Northwest. <laughs> It was a beautiful cry. She just welled up so beautifully. Thank you, Michael, for never letting me give up, no matter how hard I try to. Michael's favorite thing to say to me is, you got the goods. I don't even know what the goods are, but. <laughs> Thank you to all my friends and family who support my writing. In an earlier version of the script, I named them all and then listed all the reasons why I was thanking them. You would have hated it. It was 12 minutes long. Uh, I have one last thank you to the Meryl Streep-funded Writers Lab for female screenwriters over 40. Thank you for mentoring and empowering mature women writers. I attended the lab two years ago, and I think we have some alumni here tonight in the audience. I want to end by saying that I agree with Peter Samuelson. These are dark, dark times. But the wind is coming, I think. Thank you. Good night. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. <laughs> Our next script is Boy with Kite. Written by Renee Pillay, Boy with Kite is about a surly loner who inherits an odd little boy and must overcome her loathing of him to uncover the truth about the one person they both loved. In this scene, 10-year-old Ben makes an unwelcome entrance into 50-something Stella's life, interrupting her time with her silver fox boyfriend, Linny. She lets the boy stay, but doesn't have to like it. Interior farmhouse, Ben's bedroom, dang. Despite the bed and closet, it's pretty obvious this is storage. The shelving units are filled with bags, sacks, and cans, but the room looks clean and the bed linen fresh. Stella opens windows, turns down the bed, checks under it for some reason, muttering the whole time. 
We'll clear them shelves out later. I made it ready best I could. They didn't exactly give me a whole lot of time. Just said you'd be coming, and here you are. Ben puts his bags down. He looks around the room and lands on Stella. She just stares back. Nothing left to stay. Then? You gotta pee? Bathroom's next door. He nods. Okay. She nods. We're done here. And leaves. <laughs> Interior, farmhouse, kitchen, day. Linny nurses a beer when Stella shows up. She's put on a shirt and jeans and heads straight to making coffee. So, the boy's family. Go on, I'm listening. I don't know what for, you're the only one talking. Well, you be that way. I ain't got nothing but time. She throws a look at the bottle in his hand. You're gonna make that last till next Sunday, aren't you? I can make it last till the end of days. I'm that good. But Stella keeps her mouth shut despite that threat. So, you have a brother. What was his name again? Gabe? So, you got a brother named Gabe. It's like Chinese water torture. Head! I had a brother. He died a month ago. That shuts up Linny like nothing else. Stella, I... Well, hell, so... So you just lost him. I don't know about that. Doesn't seem like you can just lose someone if you haven't seen him in ten years. But his boy's here. Well, that's because you're looking at the winner of the little orphan lottery. Turns out, I'm the only blood he has who's not worm food. Ain't that all kinds of fucked up? About as fucked up as us being together for seven years and this being the first I heard uh, you're having a brother. Lenny, don't. I'm not. You are. <laughs> Putting his hands up, Lenny surrenders. Okay, okay. So I'm gonna go. I'll let you get your stuff settled. I'm plenty settled. Good. It'll give you more time to get the boy settled in, then. Her flesh-eating glare slides right off him. What's his name, anyway? Damned if I know. This throws Linny for, for a full second. But it's Stella, so he just kisses her and heads out. So, get his name. Try starting with that, huh? Mm. Interior farmhouse, third floor hallway, night. Ben's door cracks open to reveal him in PJ bottoms and a t-shirt several sizes too big. He heads down the stairs. Interior farmhouse, Stella's study, night. He opens the door to a room filled with bookcases, tables, chairs, and desks, all overflowing with books. There's a TV set from the 80s hooked up to a VCR. Both belong in the Smithsonian, but apparently they work, as evidenced by what's playing. Gaze glued to the TV, Ben doesn't see the precarious stack until he bumps it. It sets off an avalanche of books and stirs Stella from her place in front of the TV. She uses the remote to turn the screen black. Well, what in the holy hell are you doing here? Ben rears back, face uh, pale, eyes huge. Wait, sit, go on, sit. She nudges a chair forward with her foot. He hesitates, but finally takes an uneasy seat. Why are you up? A shrug, he doesn't know. That's when Stella realizes. I figured you were just quiet, but this ain't that, is it? What's wrong with you? Can't you speak? No response, just those watchful eyes. So why are you up? Can't get to sleeping? Got a worm in your head? Ben touches his head, <laughs> looks alarmed at the thought. Not a real worm, Jesus Christ. I meant a feeling, like how I knew you were going to be a boy when your father told me he knocked up your mother. She looks at him, really looks, and what she sees does not make her happy. God damn. You're everything I knew would happen. He was just too blind or too stupid to see it. Well, too bad for him. And too bad for me, too, I suppose. There's a bitter taste to her words. So she grabs a random book off of a table, shoves it at him. Here, it'll help you sleep. 
Go on, get your ass back to bed. Stella hits play on the remote and the TV sounds follow Ben out the door. Interior farmhouse, Ben's bedroom, day. Ben climbs into bed with the book on Paul Klee, master of the abstract. He flips the pages and reaches a painting, the Kakendemonish. Anguished and dark, it's Klee's nightmares transformed into art. Ben shuts the book and then pulls the covers over his head. Sequence, stars. The inside of his blanket becomes a galaxy of stars within the sweeping strokes of Van Gogh's starry night. He reaches up to pluck out the brightest among them. He holds it tight and closes his eyes. Tiger Williams is a film and TV writer, adjunct professor at the USC School of Cinematic Arts, the UCLA School of Theater, Film, Television, and a creative advisor with the Sundance Institute Screenwriters Lab. His credits include Menace to Society, The Perfect Guy, and the upcoming Netflix series, Madam C.J. Walker. He is currently a writer on the FX series, Snowfall. Presenting the award to Renee Pillay is Tiger Williams. I, I love, I, where is Renee? I love this script. The bickering, the bickering, the bantering, the fussing, the fighting, the little boy who's not talking. You know, you, you, you read it and you get into it and you're like, where am I headed? What is this? And I have to say, yes, you made me cry. Um, Renee hails from Malaysia. And you know, she was notified that she won the nickel. You know, she applied for her first passport. And, uh, you know, but she also needed a US visa. But the earliest interview they could get was on November 8th. <laughs> but with the help of our amazing Nickel staff, a meeting was arranged with the Cultural Affairs Office of the U.S. Embassy in Malaysia, and they agreed to uh, craft an appeal to the Consul General and uh, you know, to expedite the thing. And uh, Renee's friends got together and they pulled some money, and she hopped in the car and drove the two hours to Kuala Lumpur to the embassy. And we're happy to have her here. <laughs> you know, at, at first glance, you know, Boy with Kite, it's a it's a simple story about a woman and a man and a and a you know and a boy that upends this this family and ultimately illuminates their lives, but it's, it's much more than a simple story. It's complex. It's as complex as, as life is. It's a very human and universal story. Um, and it's not, about, it's not about a woman. It's not about, a, it's not about Malaysia. It's not about the things that often, as particular genders or people of color are expected to write, it, it touches all of us. We know all of these characters. We are all of these characters. I came away from the script caring deeply about these characters and their lives. And as I said, um, she brought a tear to my eye. And in a time when movies are increasingly becoming technological marvels, not Marvel, <laughs> technological marvels, I believe the ability to infuse real emotion into our work is a skill that's more valuable than ever. And I value you, Renee, and I couldn't be more honored to present the this year's Nichols Award to you. Um, thank you, Mr. Williams. I, I had no idea. Um, <laughs> Rosa Salazar, if you were like 40, 50 years older, 
but you're not. <laughs> um, it was amazing hearing all, it's amazing just being here um, because you've heard the story of my journey. Um, and on that front, I have to, I have a whole bunch of thank yous. I'm so sorry to subject all of you to this, um, but I'll make it very fast. Thank you to Sangya Pillay, Irvin Hiao, Julian Lee, Jenny, Christy Lau, Zoya Elena, Maslina, Kasturi Kasavan, Azlina Momat Yusuf. Some of them gave me money when times were bad. All of them gave me food and shelter when times were really bad. And they never once told me, stop writing. Um, but I, I wouldn't blame them if they did. Fact is, I've never taken a writing class. I come from 14,000 miles away. I don't even speak English half the time. Um, and I want to write movies here in Hollywood. What kind of fool thinks that is possible? <laughs> but more importantly, the reason for this is because when you come from a place where your writing's not understood, not encouraged, when there's no room for the stories you have to tell, when you're not given the space to exist, then even though these are dark times here, it's dark times all over the world. And uh, Hollywood starts to look, well, Hollywood starts to make sense, and that's a bit scary, isn't it? <laughs> um, and the sense that it makes is that there are freedoms here. Um, freedoms that so many of us take for granted. For example, uh, the freedom to write about exotic places, like Nebraska. <laughs> the freedom to write about people who are nothing like you, but who are you. The freedom to connect with others irrespective of whoever, whatever, wherever you are. Because like Ben, that little boy who doesn't speak, can speak, I suspect all of us, like me, I want it to be heard. I think we all want to be heard. And that's why <clears throat> all this work, um, all of this by Joan and, and Chris and the whole nickel, fellowship team, it's work that's not only important, it's necessary. Because if not, voices like Stella and Linny and Ben and mine would never be heard. Because if it wasn't for them, the Academy and the Nickel Committee, none of people like me, we wouldn't get a chance to be heard. And I realize now after meeting the Nickel Committee yesterday, it's because every single one of these people, I always want to say this, well, frankly, my dear, they do give a damn. <laughs> okay? They do. They totally do. So now, what I get from all this is moving forward, whenever I'm, I'm going to be told that I'm all wrong, uh, when I'm not given the room to exist, or the freedom to be, then I'll remember that improbabilities, well, they can happen. I am one of them. There can be so many more. Thank you. Our fifth script is Street Rat Alley Punches Her Ticket, written by Walker McKnight. When the leader of a gang of homeless girls makes a deal with an underworld boss to earn a ticket out of her dome-sealed city, she and her street urchin family become targets of every criminal in the place, human and otherwise. In this scene, uh, no. scene Alley, the leader of the street rats, and Moon Pie, the next oldest member, thank you, return from the streets to their sewer room hideout with a hard-fought and stolen meal. There they join the rest of the gang and enjoy a meal and a moment's respite from the cruel city above. 
Interior of the rat's nest, day. Allie and, Moon Pine, Allie and Moon Pie scramble down the ladder into the rat's nest, an old sewer access room, 15 by 15. Wood crate in the center, their table. Candles provide light. A maze of pipes covers the ceiling. Four tiny wood plank beds hang from the walls, each full of old blankets. A stream of sludge water flows lazily through the center, out of one big drainage pipe and into another. Allie reaches the floor. Looks Pushpop over, confused. Pushpop! What happened to your hair? Pushpop has a kind of greased up faux hawk. <laughs> she pats it. It's like a shark fan. Guppy did it. What? Guppy, 11, crawls in from one pipe, bright eyed and eager. She's aerodynamic now. <laughs> did you bring anything to eat? All four girls huddle around their box table. Pushpop and Guppy look hopeful. Allie fakes a sad face. Sorry, Gup. Just didn't make it happen today. Guppy tries to hide her heartbreak. It's okay. We ate Tuesday. Allie slams the gog on the table. <sighs> Guppy shrieks. What is it? The best meal you ever ate. Find me a hot pipe. The girls blur into motion, climbing the walls, using the backs of their hands to test pipes. Number six is boiling. Allie carries the gog up, produces a knife, and slices it up on top of the pipe. It sizzles. Guppy holds her stomach like she's been punched. Smells like fish. Liar, you ain't never had fish. <laughs> I had fish once. Too many feathers. Later, the four girls hunch around their crate, each with a piece of warped tin as a plate. Homemade knives and forks. Sawed off plastic soda bottles as cups, each filled with water. Allie dishes out the cooked gog. It looks like grilled whitefish. Guppy is in awe, wipes it a tear. There's so much. <laughs> Allie lifts her cup. The rest raise theirs. To the street rats! To the rats! rats! To street rat Allie. She did this. The girls dig in. It's life, it's heaven, it's everything. This is my favorite food. <laughs> you always say that. <laughs> You said it last week when we found that potato. <laughs> potato was my favorite food last week. Now it's gog. Do you think we'll eat tomorrow, Allie? We'll try. Listen to Guppy. Wanting to eat every day. Thinks she's a queen of, of the bubble. Do not. I just like eating. <laughs> Guppy lets out a huge burp. <laughs> See? <laughs> the girls burst out laughing. This is their joy. Later, the rats clean up their tiny sewer home. Getting dark, almost no daylight through the grate. They light more candles. Guppy climbs into her wall bed, one of the lower ones. Allie uses trickling water from an unscrewed pipe to wash the plates. Moon Pie leans in, almost whispering. Guppy wants you to talk her to sleep. <laughs> you can do it tonight. She wants you, Allie. Allie leaves her work and sits by Guppy's bed. A hanging sheet and a candle inside gives them an almost private space. Guppy has an ancient, beat-up earth globe in her hands. Got your earth, huh? Guppy turns it around, traces cities with her finger. What city did the bubble used to be in? Nobody really knows. But you have to guess. Allie points to Miami. Miami. Why? Just like the sound of it. Jammer swore it was New York, but she didn't know either. What about you? Guppy turns the globe to France and points at Paris. Paris. If this was Paris, we'd be speaking Parisian, silly. But maybe this is what Parisian sounds like. <laughs> Allie looks confused, then impressed. Wow, look at the brain on you, girl. <laughs> Are there really other cities out there like the bubble? Ones the train goes to? Oh, yeah. But better. They say if you get on the train, you can go to cities where humans are still in charge. No way. Humans in charge? Just like it used to be. Before the bots took over and people, you know, did all the science and turned themselves into odd bodies. Wow. And you're going there one day. It's what we do. 
Street rats all move on to the big world eventually, like Jammer and Wrecking Girl and Go Go Red before her. But you're not going soon, right? Allie's expression darkens. Pain there. Nobody inside the bubble has tickets except the big bosses. And they ain't giving them up. Jammer said she'd send me a ticket, but that was a long time ago. Probably forgot. I don't blame her. She was way better than me. A legend. Allie fishes an ancient stuffed rabbit out of Guppy's blankets and puts it in Guppy's arms. It's not weird or anything, me still having a bunny. <laughs> not even a little. Night. Allie blows out the candle. <sighs> hey, Allie. Hmm? I think you're a legend. Well, that's sweet. But you can't be a legend till you're gone. She draws the curtain. <laughs> the end. <laughs> we have another pair of committee members for our final presentation. Julia Chasman is a veteran film producer with a dozen feature credits who's been a studio executive at Showtime, Universal, and Industry Entertainment. Currently, she runs her own home design company, which designs and renovates home in the Los Angeles area. She has served on the Nickel Executive Committee for the last six years and has been a judge since her acceptance to the Academy in 2007. Daniel Petrie Jr. is an Academy Award nominee for his screenplay, Beverly Hills Cop. He is a past president of the Writers Guild of America West and current president of the Writers Guild Foundation. He is also a former governor of the Academy and a longtime member of the Academy's Nickel Fellowships Committee. Presenting the award to Walker McKnight are Julia Chasman and Daniel Petrie, Jr. Street Rat Alley, as you gather from that beautifully performed scene, leads a small band of teenage girls in their makeshift existence in the wildly original ramshackle hellish city of the future where they struggle to survive. As the eldest of the girls, Alley is charged with finding food, shelter, and keeping up the hopes of her younger charges with no means of support and only their rickety skateboards to make their way, these latter-day heirs to the pickpockets of Oliver Twist must fend off daily attacks by boys, bots, and sadistic, multi-limbed, futuristic creatures as they scramble for food. Allie not only keeps them fed, she keeps up their spirits and serves as a mother to the orphan girls, although she's not much older than they are. Julia. Can I take over? Whoops. Okay. The bombed out city where they live was once one of the great ones. Was it Paris, New York, San Francisco? We have to wait until the last train pulls out at the very end of the story to find out. Walker McKnight has created a uniquely terrifying and fabulous post-apocalyptic city of the future. As he put it himself in his artist statement, a fun dystopia populated by multi-limbed freakish creatures and robots but the main characters are all beautifully realized young women. And the spirit of the script is undeniable, full of action, drama, humor, heart, and humanism. It's a unique combination for the sci-fi genre. A native of Atlanta, Georgia, Walker McKnight didn't start writing seriously until he was 30. The time has been well spent, though, as the assurance of his years shows in his command of his craft. 
and a voice which is all his own. Please help me welcome to the stage 2019 Nickel Fellow, Walker McKnight. This is uh, a major phobia of mine, and I'm about to have a panic attack, so. I'll take my speech away. You don't need that. I think I'm going to read this whole page in about 15 seconds, so just <laughs> hold on. Thank you, Dan and Julia, for the incredibly kind words. Um, uh, thanks to Gian Don Nickel for the gift of this competition and the Academy for putting so much effort and so many resources into it for so many years. Uh, thanks to Joan Y and Chris Garchi and the Nickel staff for doing the hard work of running the fellowship. Um, thanks to Jennifer Yoon Nelson and the Nickel Committee for taking time out of their uh, wonderful careers to help those of us trying to learn this craft. Uh, it means a lot. And uh, thanks to the other fellows and finalists uh, for being such fun and supportive partners in this process. Uh, I also have to thank the great screenwriting teachers I've had because uh, they've been huge. Uh, my first teachers, Jenna Milley and Michael Lucker, my professor, Jack Boozer from GSU, and Tim Albaugh, who's been a big friend and supporter. Uh, these people have had to read my worst scripts, and it probably took years off their lives to do so. Um, I'm sure it did. Uh, but like great teachers, somehow they were still able to uh, encourage me to keep going. And I think if any one of them had said something different than that, I, I might not have. Um, Thank you to Rose and Amanda and, and Wes and Tyrese for that incredible read. I never expected to hear dialogue that I've written spoken by anyone other than the voices in my own head, and there are a lot of those. You're much better than those voices. Uh, that was incredible, and thank you, Gita, for, um, for directing that. Um, thanks to my brother Brian for being a wonderful friend and movie-watching partner all my life. Uh, but above all, above all, thanks to my parents, Wanda and Walker, who fed my love of uh, fantasy and sci-fi from my earliest memories through reading to me and uh, indulging my constant requests to bring home VHS uh, movie rentals with monsters in them. Uh, they have continued to encourage their child uh, in this crazy career path long, long after he's passed an age that any child should need to be encouraged in a career path. <laughs> so I can't thank them enough, and I love you. Um, as Julia mentioned, I really didn't start writing until age 30. I have no idea what I was doing before that. I, just staring at a wall, I guess. Um, <laughs> with, a, with a relatively late start like that comes a pretty healthy dose of imposter syndrome. Um, I've often felt like I was trespassing on somebody else's career field, uh, something that was meant really for only people who just knew it was their calling since childhood or high school or college or even their 20s. Um, and uh, so for 15 years, my imposter syndrome, it, it's been like a constant roommate. And, and lately, honestly, it's really started to feel more like the landlord, a really, a really terrible one banging on the door and shouting at all hours. Um, thanks to Nickel, I now have something to shout back, and that's a, a really wonderful thing. Uh, to close, I just want to say that good stories are the most magical thing in the world to me. Uh, my favorite storytellers... Uh, throughout my life have been able to conjure something out of nothing and make me actually care. And the difficulty of accomplishing that never ceases to blow my mind. Uh, this is the craft that I'm trying to learn. And uh, if I'm ever able to bring even just a tiny fraction of the thrill to somebody that my favorite storytellers brought to me, then I'll be happy. Thank you. Well, that concludes our 2019 Nickel Award presentation and live read. Another big thank you to our actors Amanda Stenberg, Rosa Salazar, Tyrese Gibson, and Wes Studi. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Congratulations again to the Nickel Fellows as they begin their year. Thank you all for showing them such warm support. For anyone who's out there writing or thinking about writing, we hope you feel inspired to put your words down on the page and share your stories. Safe journey home to everyone. A warning that the parking garages will close 30 minutes from now. <laughs> so thank you and good night.